The FRCR clinical examination tests a candidate's ability to identify abnormal physical signs, to detect and report relevant negative findings, and to make a provisional assessment of the patient's fitness for treatment. This remains a vital component of clinical practice and the FRCR examination. It allows the examiners to judge the candidate's interaction with a real patient. Once the patient has been examined, the candidate is expected to formulate a management plan based on the physical findings and general fitness of the patient. In essence, this is a test of clinical skills, assimilation of information and formulation of a safe and appropriate treatment plan. Candidates are sent instructions regarding the exam location and their arrival time. On arrival, they will register and be asked to hand in their mobile phone and other electronic devices, which are held in safekeeping until the end of the post-exam quarantine period. This is essential to protect examination security. There will commonly be four rotations in a session. In each rotation, there are five stations, each lasting eight minutes with a 90-second gap in between. Depending on the number of candidates, there may be a sixth rest station added to some rotations. Before starting, candidates will be asked to wait in one room. After they have completed the exam, they will be shown to a separate quarantine room, where they will remain until the final rotation has started. The examiners work in pairs, chosen on the basis of their site specialisms. They arrive early to meet and examine the patients. The pair of examiners, plus one of the senior examiners, will examine the patient, agree the physical signs, and determine the questions to be asked and the expected answers. The essential points needed to pass and a scoring system, matched to the anchor statement shown on the college website, are agreed. All candidates are asked the same questions. There are commonly two patients per station who alternate between rotations. Prior to each rotation, each group of candidates will gather for a brief introduction from one of the senior examiners. This film should be viewed as a demonstration which shows elements of the examination. It's not possible to recreate the atmosphere of the examination, but this film will give you an insight into the way exams are conducted and the nature of the questions asked. Good morning. My name is Peter Bliss, one of the senior examiners, and congratulations on passing the Part 2A. This means you have the core knowledge required to pass the FRCR examination. In a few minutes, the exam will start. You'll be taken by the staff to the area outside your clinical station. You'll find hand gel there. Please use it. The bell to start the examination won't sound until everybody's hands are dry. Also outside the station, there will be a synopsis of the case. Please read this carefully. When the bell sounds, the exam starts immediately and you will be taken into the clinical station. You'll be met by your two examiners, who will introduce themselves and the patient. There may be one or two observers of the exam process there as well. Your interaction will be with your two examiners. You'll have eight minutes per station. After five minutes, one of the staff will indicate to the examiners that there are three minutes remaining on the station. This is so that the examiners can pace the questioning and ensure that you get through all of the key items within the time allotted. At eight minutes, a bell will sound to indicate that the time is up and you will be asked to leave the station. It is in your best interest to leave the station promptly so that you can move to your next station, wait outside, use the hand gel and read the clinical synopsis before starting the next case. After the 90 seconds, the bell will sound and the exam will start again immediately, just as in the previous station. Please examine the patients gently and carefully. Your physical findings and the way that you interact with the patient form an important part of the assessment of the clinical examination. The clinical cases presented are those that you will see in everyday practice and address the same problems. The examiners are here to help you if an answer seems straightforward, it probably is. We strongly advise you not to use techniques with which you're not familiar. Please just do what you would normally do in your own hospitals day in and day out. Do make your answers relevant to the patient in front of you, not just a textbook response. The examiners are looking for a thoughtful response relevant to the patient in question. I'll just remind you again that if you don't hear a question, 
please ask the examiners to repeat it. They'll be only too pleased to help. At the end of the uh, examination round, you will have to go into the quarantine room. I'm afraid you're not able to take any mobile phones or internet-enabled devices in there in order to protect the integrity of the exam. Once the final round of candidates have arrived and been checked in, then you're free to leave. So finally, all that remains is just to ask if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, and then finally, really, to wish you the very best of luck, and we would like you to do very well. Thank you. Hello, candidate 691. Hi, I'm Chris Bourne. Hello, Elena Wilson. Hello. And this is Mr Smith, who's going to let you examine him. So Mr Smith is a very fit 70-year-old man who presents with throat pain on swallowing. Um, I'd like you to examine his oral cavity, oropharynx and neck, please. Okay. Um, would it be okay to examine you, sir? Of course. And uh, do you have any pain anywhere at all? It only hurts when I swallow. Okay, I'll be careful. Um, I'm just going to start by having a look at you, if that's okay. Can I have a look at your hands, if that's okay? That's lovely, excellent. I'm just going to have a quick look at your chest as well, if that's all right. Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, would it be okay to have a look in your mouth with a torch, if that's all right? Okay. Yes, of course. So I'm just going to pop this on. And I'm just going to get you to open your mouth nice and wide, if that's okay. That's lovely. I'm just going to get you to pop your tongue to the right-hand side, if that's all right. And to the left. That's lovely. And to the top of your mouth, if that's okay. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm just going to press down on the tongue with the wooden spatula while I have a look, if that's all right. Yes, go ahead. Just pop your mouth open. That's lovely. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to pop a glove on and have a quick feel at the back of the tongue, if that's OK. Actually, we'd rather you didn't. Um, we've got 15 candidates this morning, and obviously we don't want to make Mr Smith too sore. Um, actually, digital examination wouldn't add anything to what you can already see. OK. okay. Uh, I'm just going to have a feel of the neck, if that's OK, then. Yeah, sure. Thank you. OK. Right. Um, can you describe your findings, please? Uh, yes. So Mr Smith um, is a fit-looking gentleman who's well-nourished. Uh, there was no obvious scars or tattoos present, and there was no feeding tube. Uh, looking in his mouth, I could see an obvious malignant mass arising from the right tonsil, uh, which was ulcerated. I could also feel a uh, right level two node um, which was enlarged at approximately three and a half centimetres, um, which was mobile and not fixed to the skin. OK. Anything else? Uh, so um, I couldn't feel any other lymph nodes. No. OK. And can you tell me anything more about the primary? Uh, so it looked approximately uh, four, four to five centimetres, um, and it was extending onto the palate. And anything else about the oral cavity? Um, so the tongue moved normally, there was no trismus. Fine. So how are you going to investigate him? Um, so I bring him along to the joint head and neck clinic um, when I would discuss with the surgeons um, performing an EUA and biopsy. Um, he would also need a staging CT scan to include the neck, chest and abdomen. OK. So biopsy shows poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Um, the CT scan shows what you've described. 
plus a 1.5 centimeter left level 3 node and the radiologists are, are undecided whether it's benign or malignant. So what would you do? Um, so you could uh, perform an ultrasound and FNA of that node. Oh, and would you? Uh, yes, I would. Okay. So he has the ultrasound which shows a reactive looking node and FNA shows no malignant cells. Okay. So what stage? So uh, this is a primary tumour of over four centimetres. It's a T3 tumour uh, N2A. And any further information you'd like? Um, so I would like to do some, some routine blood tests, including blood count and renal function in particular. Okay, they're all normal. Anything else? Um, so I'd like to know his P16 status from this histology. Um, so P16 is positive. Okay. This is the five-minute warning to help the examiners ensure that they ask the most important questions within the time frame allowed. Now, how are you going to treat him? Um, so he's a fit gentleman with a performance status of zero, so I think he'll be suitable for radical treatments. Um, I would uh, not uh, favour surgery because that could leave significant uh, swallowing problems. Um, so I would recommend they had uh, chemo radiotherapy. OK, good. We agree. So um, can you tell me about your radiotherapy? Uh, yes, so I would use an IMRT technique um, to treat two different dose levels as I do in our centre. Um, so the high dose level would include the primary tumour uh, and the uh, abnormal lymph node as well as uh, all of the level 2 lymph nodes. And then the uh, CTV2 uh, would include uh, the rest of the neck bilaterally, uh, 1 beta 5. Okay. So this is a slice of the planning CT scan. Um, I'd like you to draw the GTVs and then the high-dose CTV, please. Um, so my uh, GTV um, would be the primary disease there, and then the abnormal lymph node would be there. Um, and my high-dose CTV, so there will be a 10 millimeter margin around the GTV. Um, so that would include this being a 10 millimetre margin. So what else does your CTV1 include? So it would uh, also potentially include level 3 nodes on the right because the enlarged node might extend its level 3 as well as the retropharyngeal nodes bilaterally. So what doses are you going to give? So I'd give the high dose uh, 65 grey in 30 fractions and the low dose 54 grey in 30 fractions. Okay. And you mentioned chemo. Uh, yes, so I'd give him cisplatin which would be 100 milligrams per metre squared given at the start of week 1 and the start of week 4. So is there anything else you need to think about in preparing Mr Smith for treatment? Uh, so yes, he would need a dental assessment. OK. Anything else? Um, so uh, I would discuss with him the uh, option of having a, a PEG fitted prior to commencing treatment and refer also to the dietitian. So he's really not keen on having a, a PEG tube and he says that he's taking painkillers and eating normally. What, what would you say? Um, so I would warn him that his mouth uh, may get sore during his treatment and his swallowing may get worse. Um, and I'd warn about the, the possibility of needing an NG tube to be placed during his treatment. So what long-term effects are you going to discuss with Mr Smith? Um, so I'd warn him of the, the risk of osteoradionecrosis, of um, altered taste and a dry mouth. OK. Anything else? Effect on uh, beard growth. Okay. And, and what about swallowing? Uh, so I would warn him that there are long-term risks um, of effects on swallowing of his treatment, yes. And what sort of risk would you quote? Uh, so I'd quote a 1-2% to risk of requiring a long-term feeding tube. Fine. Well, that's all our questions. So we now stand quietly until the bell goes. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr Smith.
I thought he did a good GTV and node, um, sensible margin of 10 millimeters. His CTV1 is not bad, but the coverage was a bit generous on level two, and he did include the whole of the sternomastoid and part of the parotid. Mm. Um, he did manage to cover the retropharyngeal nodes though, so overall not bad. Yeah. He, he seems very safe and sound. Yes, but he didn't include the um, small node on the left. He yeah. did need some prompting um, and didn't push the patient for a feeding tube. Also, I thought his risk of long-term swallowing problems was too low. Yeah. Yeah. The examiners both commit to a mark. If there is a discrepancy of two grades, they will then discuss the candidate at the end of the cycle to ascertain why the difference has occurred and to check that something hasn't been missed or misheard. If, after that, both examiners are still happy with their scoring, they will discuss it with the senior examiner. The final decision will be made following this discussion. This case was scripted so that the candidate scored a good safe pass. The examiners differed in their scores, one giving a three, bare pass, and the other a four, clear pass. He did a fairly good examination, although his description of the primary could have been more detailed and succinct. He also missed a small node in the left neck, but the examiners had agreed in advance that it was difficult to find and that this would not be marked too harshly. His staging and investigations were fine. His GTVs were good. The CTV was a little generous but not excessive. His acceptance of Mr Smith's desire not to have a tube suggests a lack of experience, as there's very little prospect of him getting through treatment without one, and his estimate of the risk of long-term swallowing issues was too low. On the positive side, the management plan and chemo-radiotherapy were safe and sound, with nothing that would have compromised this patient's chance of cure. We are aware that some centres would use three dose levels or omit some lymph node areas. Also, some centres may use a non-IMRT conformal radiotherapy approach. The candidate very sensibly described treatment according to his centre's local policy. The choice of technique will not affect the marking as long as the treatment is safe and well executed. It's the candidate's performance which is being assessed.